Hey everyone, Chris here. Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you're enjoying it and learning something along with us, please consider becoming a supporting patron at patreon.com slash a teacher of history. Or you could leave a rating and review on iTunes. It would be a huge help. If you'd like to raise your hand and participate along with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, at a teacher fifth, or shoot me an email, chris at a teacher history.com. All right, let's get on to the next episode. And welcome into a teacher of history of the United States. Thanks so much for joining us again today. Did you know that although the Indian Removal Act was passed in 1830, the ever so famous Trail of Tears did not occur for another eight years in 1838? And that during the debate over the Indian Removal Act, a gentleman in the House of Representatives named Davy Crockett stood up and argued against it. And did you know that following the Indian Removal Act, a case was taken to the Supreme Court in which the Supreme Court determined that the states had no rights to do things like remove natives from their land. But Andrew Jackson didn't really enforce that. Once again, showing that Andrew Jackson did what Andrew Jackson thought should be done. Did you know all of this? Maybe. Maybe not. Get your notebooks out because today, Zach Woods and I will cover that and more in episode 125, the Indian Removal Act. All right, everyone. Welcome into episode 125, the uh, Indian Removal Act, Andrew Jackson and the Indian Removal Act. Um, So welcome back Zach Woods, it has been way too long since you've been on the podcast. It is good to have you back, buddy. Yeah, just some major life developments, a house, a marriage, a marriage delayed yeah. by pandemics, you know. Yep. You were tra- you were traveling all over the place. Yes. Uh, traveling a ton for pleasure and for work. It's uh so it, it's been it's been rough I don't doing think all I'm, this doing all this without you. Yeah, but. I don't think I'm gonna see my in laws in Spain in a very long time. Yeah, pro- probably not for a long time. Good, probably. good. I got to see him for a little bit there. Yes, absolutely. So it's great to have you back. Um, Zach and I were just chatting about this in our production meeting, and we likely are going to be handling this episode a little bit different than most of our extra credits. Uh, we there are a few things in toward the beginning of the episode that I really want to get into. Um, and that I want to talk about, and Zach will jump in here and there, but for the most part, um, I want to really provide you guys with some context around what we're talking about with the Indian Removal Act, and, and then it will likely become a bit more of a conversation as we go through. So just want to give you a heads up about that, and what Zach and I are talking about today is the Indian Removal Act passed during Jackson's first term. And it will continue to have, just so you know, it will continue to have lingering effects for quite a while. I mean, some historians argue up to 20 or 30 years of this um, migration, forced migration of Native Americans. And I will be covering the Trail of Tears in more detail when we get to it in 1838 in our podcast narrative. So I do want to give you a heads up. We're not really going in depth on the Trail of Tears in this episode, but we will get into it. So, the Indian Removal Act signed into law on May 28, 1830, and it authorized Andrew Jackson, the federal government specifically, to negotiate with Southern Native American tribes for their removal to federal territory west of the Mississippi River. As I've mentioned before, that was federal territory, and Jackson believed if he moved natives there, then they could rightfully claim their uh, native sovereignty without conflicting with the idea of states' rights. And he mentioned that to Congress all the way back in his first day of the Union in 1829. 
The Indian Removal Act was signed into law by Jackson, but will be carried out, like I mentioned, for quite a while, uh, for the next decade, all through Martin Van Buren's presidency. So this is not something that's going to go away, so to speak, in our narrative. It was celebrated by some and, as you can imagine, hated by others. So a bit of a background and refresher on Native relationships and movement up to this point. In the southeast, you had the Cherokees, the Creeks, the Choctaws, and a lot of change was occurring within these communities, especially since the Revolutionary War. Um, After the British withdrawal following the revolution, these Native Americans were now forced to negotiate with the United States of America. And through this assimilation or acculturation that happened much more gradually in some areas than others, there was an evolution and adaptation to new farming methods along with uh, the aforementioned assimilation and acculturation to the um, white American way of life. Because as you know, many uh, white Americans wanted to turn Native Americans into the small small farmers, small peasant farmers um, or yeoman farmers. And that was uh, you know Thomas Jefferson's ideal vision for the United States of America. The Cherokees at, at this time, up to this point, were focusing on trying to centralize their governmental power, which they had. Uh, they had a constitution by the time Jackson was elected president. And then further north, north of the Ohio River, we see a huge movement of Americans, white Americans, into the Ohio River Valley. This will lead to conflict, um, and we see this in the fallout. And then, of course, the sparking of the War of 1812 over the Ohio River Valley and the British support of the natives in the area. Um, We then have the Creek Wars with Jackson's rise to fame, the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, um, which is often grouped, and we sort of did a a bit in this podcast, grouped that in with the War of 1812. Um, And then things really take a turn for the worse for the Native Americans in uh, 1815 and in 1816 following the signing of the Treaty of Ghent, which ended the War of 1812. And the reason is, is that Native Americans are totally left out of those negotiations. And so the movement of Americans into native land following that treaty increased dramatically. The British were no longer involved um, directly or indirectly. And so especially in areas like the Ohio River Valley, um, white Americans really began to massively migrate into those areas. And so with all of this happening, native Americans were often stuck with one of really two approaches – Right? We either assimilate to uh, white America and we begin to act more like them to keep them off our back and to prevent violence or we fight against it. And now some believed and rightfully so and, and look, I'm, we're, I'm not taking sides here. There's no right or wrong to what Native Americans decide to do with their lives, um, their property and their family. Um, some believe the loss of life wasn't worth it. And the best thing for them as a community was to negotiate with the um, United States of America and see if there's an opportunity to coexist. Others didn't agree with that, and they moved west to get away from it, or they tried to fight against it. Um, There was a long history. By the early 1800s, um, there's a long history of natives living amongst and working within traders and with traders and merchants such as the French and the British, um, i.e. the Miami in Ohio. And so it was possible. Uh, they were able to do it. Um, but each tribe and, and within like different pockets of each tribe were able to make those determinations for themselves how they wanted to do it. And one thing that I found to be interesting, there there's a book I read um, that – we're not going to cover a bunch of the stuff in the book because it was more about like Indians in the north, but it was called Land Too Good for Indians, Northern Indian Removal. I probably should have mentioned it at the beginning of the episode. Land Too Good for Indians, Northern Indian Removal by John P. Bowes, B-O-W-E-S. And it was really good. And he mentioned something about adaptive resistance. And adaptive resistance, what uh, Professor Bowes said, Dr. Bowes, I don't, don't certainly don't want to offend him. Um, I, I'm sure I'm sure he's a cool guy. I'm sure he doesn't mind. But one thing that he mentioned was this idea of adaptive resistance. 
and this was when Native Americans would welcome and adapt to some things while simultaneously trying to utilize the relationships they have between um, themselves and white Americans to prove that they can fit in, which would give them an opportunity to try to hold on to their land. And most that assimilated tried to use this type of adaptive resistance, like we'll go along to get along, and if we do that, maybe we can hang on to the land that we have. But of course, as you know, not everyone agreed with that. You have Tenskwetawa, uh, Tecumseh, the prophet. Um, they believed that this type of approach wasn't going to work, and they needed to hold on to their land, and they needed to fight back in order to do it. And in the War of 1812, that's the primary reason why they allied themselves with the British, and they believed it was the only way to stop the loss of their land to white America. The only thing I would add, Chris, is that basically uh, the native peoples are different tribes, different nations. Those nations view themselves differently, and they're often competing with each other. So throughout this period, there are, are brief periods of alliance, uh, like Tecumseh in the War of 1812, uh, like Pontiac's War, if people remember that episode mm -hmm. way back where myriad of native groups come together to resist Western encroachment from European settlers. Uh, these ultimately uh, so sometimes are very successful in the battlefield, but strategically they lose. And additionally, uh, they are sometimes very successful in the battlefield. Strategically, they lose as Western encroachment is not stopped and lands are ceded either through treaty or, for, or through seizure. Uh, the other thing is that the relationship between Europeans and natives is changing now that the United States is starting to grow into their adolescence, I guess you could say. Uh, historically, there would be traders, uh, e explorers. There was a willingness to go into native country to uh, trade. And not just to seize land uh, as a speculator to then sell to new settlers or for Western expansion and manifest destiny, which we'll get to. But this Indian Removal Act and this period is basically where that relationship fundamentally changes. Yes, the whole time, mm -hmm. West, right, Europeans are basically always trying to get more land uh, and trying to push yeah. the natives further and further back. But there was a tension. They, they were creating new worlds. There was new introductions. Uh, you know, somebody basically around Fort Pitt or Fort Duquesne in the late 18th century, those relationships the, and familial bonds were a little bit different. By, you know, 1830 now, it, the U.S. policy or by the Jackson administration is basically uh, we need all the land. The natives need to go west of the Mississippi. We will move them west of the Mississippi. They will be better for it that we've moved them west for the Mississippi. And this will be great because we'll have all this extra land that we can settle more people on. And the subtext of all of this is big chunks of land that are still very sparsely populated in the United States that were the, uh, the Choctaw and, and Cherokee and Creek lands uh, that basically would just become plantations. <laughs> yeah. So um, the subtext of all of this, regret to say, is the expansion of slavery, which is another big trend of American history that we have to talk about in this middle 19th century period because we are progressing towards the Civil War. Yeah, it, no, absolutely. Those are great points. And I do think that the, the one thing that's important for for the listener and, and for us as we talk about this stuff to keep in mind is that this really was about land. I mean, it, it was about land. And yes, um, Jackson made, practically speaking, of valid points that there, there's a good chance that, you know, I'm not going to be able to stop it. There's a good chance that these uh, Native American lifestyles and communities will die out eventually because it's been happening. It happened all over the North. Um, it happened in other areas. It's going to eventually happen. I'm not going to be able to stop this wave of momentum. Um, but, but let's not pretend like it wasn't about gaining land. I mean, they, <laughs> they discovered gold in Georgia in 1828. Um, quite a bit. And so it's not a coincidence that all of a sudden in 1828, um, there became a real big issue with native land. And by the way, the gold was in native land. So um, this is also it, a trend. It, it, this will happen in the yes. Black Hills and, and the mm -hmm. Northern Plains. Oh, it happened over and over again. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's hard not to get depressed about this just because um, 
there are myths, especially living in Texas now, that we tell that Texans tell themselves about conquering the West, and the natives are uh, an obstacle to overcome. Almost, you know, this force that comes down the hills and raids and whatnot, and not quite the exact time period that we're in, but uh, the trend of basically, oh, you know, we're going to make a deal. This land is yours. Don't worry. There's nobody going to come. Just sign off on this, and then twenty, thirty years later. Right back to hey, uh, that land. That land's our land now. And actually, you guys need to leave yeah. and go over there. <laughs> and yeah. we will briefly talk about the Black Hawk War. But part of that is the uh, uh, the the Osage and Sauk, which are native peoples that originated from the Saint Lawrence River Valley that have been pushed back so far that finally one that one of their chiefs, Black Hawk when told to go west of the Mississippi is just like, no, I'm, I'm done with this. I'm not leaving anymore. Yeah, you might kill me, you might win, but no more. And there's something mm-hmm. admirable about that. And again, there will be other characters in U.S. history, uh, Koala Parker, uh, Crazy Horse, <laughs> Red Cloud, um, Geronimo of Native Resistance to American expansion. And yeah. it's uh, as somebody who's always loved the underdog, uh, it's hard not to root for those guys, uh, even though they all inevitably lose. Yeah, and I mean, you can see there were Delaware, Delaware Indians in pre- pe- who had been pushed to Wisconsin, present-day Wisconsin, into Canada. Um, and I think one the, thing that's the, really the, important... The Delaware, yep. the Lenape. Lenape, yeah. Named Delaware right. for the Delaware Bay, the state of Delaware. And, you know, uh, it's pretty easy to kind of, you know, throw shade on Andrew Jackson and his administration for, for doing this. But in his 1830 State of the Union, he does basically call out uh, Eastern hypocrisy or Northeastern hypocrisy, which is basically mm-hmm. like, hey, you guys killed all your Indians. You kicked them all out uh, in the revolution. And before that, you know, why don't we get to do that, essentially? And um, yeah. that is another interesting trend that's going to happen in the American identity. Uh Native peoples will be viewed as the noble savage myth that they somehow had a good relationship with nature and weren't uh, were basically removed from the political backstabbing and bad behavior of modernity and you know almost like Garden of Eden type thing. So oftentimes when uh, native chieftains are invited to eastern cities, they become celebrities that people want to go see and 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 talk to, and this will happen. With Crazy Horse Red Cloud, it happens actually with Black Hawk after he uh, after the end of his war. This is a repeated event that occurs. Yet every time, you know, they, they, the that their celebrity doesn't translate into into actually um, political validation in the eyes of yeah. the U.S. government, where it still comes back to, oh, there's something on your land that we need. Now you need to move again. Mm-hmm. Well, what I, what I, one thing I, I found when I would study the removal of Native Americans and, and this pattern that has existed since, I mean, we, heck, we, you can go all the way back to 1820, or um, I'm sorry, uh, 1620, not 1820, 1620, and you see that the uh, pilgrims were able to land so easily because all the native the native community have been wiped out because they all got disease from fishermen who had landed in the area Mm -hmm. and i mean so like the native population started to get wiped out before (laughs) before the pilgrims even landed and and the pattern just continues and one thing that i would talk about um when i taught this stuff in, in my class um is that it can teach you a lot about uh, studying the relationship between the U.S. government and Native Americans can teach you a lot about life, and it can teach you a lot about society, and it can teach you a lot about politics. Because in the end, it's a game of leverage over and over again. Who has the leverage, and how are they able to use the leverage? And the U.S. government, over and over again, were able to gain leverage, use it to their advantage, um, take advantage of the situation— and wait until they were forced to do – and then continue to build up more leverage. And then when they were forced to do it again, they did it again well, and yeah. again and again. Well, it's interesting because uh, there is a tension, and some of that tension is similar to what happened after the French and Indian War 
where the British basically drew a line around the, down the Appalachian Mountains and was basically like, all right, mm-hmm. don't go over there. We don't want to deal with it. Just stay over here. And, and the colonists... Yeah. Proclamation uh, line, yeah, 1760. They kept pushing yep. and kept pushing. So the U.S. government finds itself at times basically being the same as you know Great Britain being like hey this is the line don't go over it we're not going to help you and it's uh US citizens or states uh force the government's hands and there's yeah. always an uh you can always gin up anger against uh minority groups especially uh, those that are resisting western migration of 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 whites the great irony of all mm-hmm. this though is that these areas where they are pushed from, and uh, at least some of the areas in the south, I should say, uh, the northeast is a little bit different because it's pretty populated. But the areas that they were pushed to to the west, and then where they were removed from the west, were largely, are still largely pretty sparsely populated compared to other parts of the country. So, you know, you could have very easily have envisioned, uh, and al- the alternative probably never could have happened. But it would have been, yeah, you know, it would have been nice had there. Just take Oklahoma, for instance. So Oklahoma, and this is the conclusion of the Indian Removal Act, is these various nations are removed west of the Mississippi. Most of them are put into Oklahoma, into what we now consider Oklahoma was called Indian Territory. Mm-hmm. And it will be Indian Territory basically until 1890. And, yeah, I was about to say yeah. it for a long time. And in at that time, then basically the U.S. government goes, well, we just want to give away a bunch of land for free to some immigrants. And this is still when uh, immigration, all you had to do is basically show up in the country. You didn't mm-hmm. do passports or papers or nothing was required. And uh, all the land was seized and small reservations were created. And uh, the founding of Oklahoma is pretty crazy in part because of that. And then, not trying to throw shade at it, but there's other stories around what happens to the native peoples on the reservations in Oklahoma. For instance, there's uh, a community that discovers oil and becomes rich. And uh, I will find this book and we can put it in the link. Uh, But basically a bunch of white people marry into the family and they start murdering (laughs) their Indian relatives so that they can get the oil. And you're just like, oh my God. (laughs) Yeah. So it's pretty rough. There's, it's, this is, I don't know if there's any way to talk about this without feeling sad, given also that there's coronavirus around, but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty depressing. So I don't know if you want to kick yeah. off about like what the act no, actually says and, and the law. Yeah, no, no. And, and I think, and, and, and I will, but before I dive into that, I, I, I do agree with you. It is pretty depressing. Um, and it is for, I mean, for me, it's a great it it is a, like this is realpolitik. This is how the world works, unfortunately, one way or another. And you can definitely learn from it by examining it. Um, but this did not just happen overnight. And that that's one thing I want to make sure that I mention. Um, you know, I, I, I mentioned how the natives were getting wiped out by disease before the pilgrims even landed. But let's get closer to our timeline now. When you're in the 1780s and you have the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which was looking toward area in the Ohio River Valley to plot it out and make states from it. Well, the assumption was there would be no natives there. Um, following the Louisiana Purchase, Jefferson would talk openly about putting natives in Louisiana. Madison spoke publicly about uh, the eventual relocation of Native Americans. John, President John Quincy Adams spoke publicly about the idea of removal. So this isn't just an Andrew Jackson thing. It's not just a Georgia thing. Um, this had been for the elephant in the room for quite a while, and the I, I believe the finding of gold in Georgia in 1828 was one of the things that really uh, pushed it forward with more momentum. Um, and, and then, of course, there are examples of Native American groups signing treaties all over the southeast in the Ohio River Valley to um, confe- confeding land during this time too. And, of course, the primary reason for the Indian Removal Act was, as we mentioned, land, and it's what it was about from the very beginning. So we, we've talked about the various efforts to remove Native Americans with, the, I mentioned, like the, the various treaties that, that had been signed, and it, this had been happening for about the past 30 years. And if you remember, starting off with, with George Washington as president, the idea of assimilation or acculturation 
was the most common approach to solving the American uh, Native American quote unquote problem um, that many white Americans believed that they were facing. So, what exactly does that mean? Well, natives were encouraged to convert to Christianity, learn to speak and read English. Um, and adopt European-style economic practices such as individual ownership of land or other property. Jefferson then reinforced this idea of allowing natives to continue to live and have their rights respected if they were willing to adapt and assimilate themselves to American culture. But all of that changed when Jackson was elected president. Uh, As we've mentioned, he made clear in his first address that he was going to take a more radical stance on this and and really push the ball forward. And Jackson made clear that while he supported it, uh, assimilation and acculturation, he was not going to just wait, to, like take a wait and see approach like his predecessors were. He was going to um, really push to do something about it. So the Indian Removal Act was passed in 1830, 28 to 19 in the Senate and 101 to 97 in the House. So it was a close vote. It had the obvious consequence of removing natives and giving uh, southern states more land, which we've mentioned. One of the people who was in the House who spoke out against it was a congressman, a Whig congressman from Tennessee named Davy Crockett, who went way back with Mr. Jackson and did not like him. And uh, the irony, of course, is that Davy Crockett would be a filibuster and go into Texas and die there. (laughs) Oh, I did not. Yeah, I well, I knew that, but I I didn't know that. Well, he also he has the greatest being the greatest yeah. Texas quote: "Y'all can go to hell, and I will go to Texas." <laughs> I like it. I like it. So while I mean, while this was passed in 1830, this had been brewing for decades in the state of Georgia. The reason why it hadn't happened up to this point is that Georgia was promised by the federal government that when the time was right and the federal government was able to purchase the land, they would remove the natives from the land. This agreement, though, according to other southern states, did not prevent or preclude them from passing their own state laws, forcibly removing natives. So at this point, Andrew Jackson was starting to feel pressure. Uh, So he moved to implement federal action to make uniform policy across all the states because he thought that there was a good chance that other southern states might act before he did, and he could not have that happen. So once again, Jackson viewing this as something that was just like, this is inevitable, is going to happen. So if it's going to happen, it's going to have to happen in a uniform way um, by a directive from the federal government. This was all prompted by the belief Jackson held uh, from past precedent. Washington made treaties with natives like they were a foreign nation, and the Supreme Court handed down a decision allowing natives to live on state land. But Jackson viewed the U.S. as a federation of highly esteemed states, and this violated, in his mind, the state sovereignty laid out in the Constitution. So even though Washington and the Supreme Court may have viewed them differently, um, he truly believed he was in the right here, or at least that's what he argued. As you can imagine, the Indian Removal Act was really strongly supported in the South, especially Georgia, right? Duh. Um, But it was very controversial throughout the rest of the nation. Many Americans favored its passage, but there was bitter opposition. It only passed after a long debate in Congress and, like I mentioned, a very close vote in the House of Representatives. Now, as he had mentioned in his 1829 State of the Union, Jackson didn't necessarily want the demise of Native American tribes in the U.S., but he did view it as inevitable. He backed up this claim when Northern critics would oppose him, and Zach, you pointed this out a few minutes ago, Northern critics would oppose him by pointing out, uh, he would point out to them that they were a bunch of hypocrites, seeing as how their ancestors had driven all the natives from the land and kept expanding west, forcing statehood and state laws on Northern Native tribes, which... He had a good point because that did happen. If anything, he said history just proved his point. Now, some historians contend that Jackson genuinely believed that the Indian Removal Act was both necessary and humane. If the native state and states like Georgia, their tribe would go extinct. They'd seen it happen time and time again. Um, Whether you believe it or not, Um, There is reason to believe that Jackson was genuine about this, but certainly he likely harbored some prejudices that we would be incredibly uncomfortable with our leaders having today. Um, But it wasn't 2020, it was the 1830s. 
So this act, put in when put into effect, implemented the forced removal of natives from their land to the West in an event widely known, as I mentioned very early in this episode, as the Trail of Tears. The first um, treaty that removed Native Americans happened uh, September 27th, 1830, in which the Choctaws in Mississippi ceded their land east of the river in exchange for payment and land west of the river. The Cherokee were removed in the Treaty of New Dakota in 1835, which we'll talk more about when we get to when we get there to the end of Jackson's presidency and into Van Buren. Um, and the Cherokee were paid five million dollars for their removal. Now there was one. Yep, Zach. One of the things that the Cherokee were promised in the Treaty of Dakota is a representative in Congress, which was never fulfilled upon. And if folks have been paying attention to the Shocker. news recently, the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma is seeking to send their first delegate to Congress per this treaty. We'll see what happens, but a little bit of recent news. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> good, good luck to them. Um, that, that would be awesome, but yeah, I can't see that happening. Um, the, the primary, like I mentioned early, earlier in the episode, the primary um, – migration happened uh, of the Cherokee happened in 1838 and we'll be covering that when we talk about Van Buren. Now there was one um, pretty big Supreme Court case that came out of uh, this entire this entire mess really because Indian removal was messy. This was not some type of orderly removal of the native peoples with with a, a well-founded and laid out plan for their survival. Um, it was, it happened in disparate, it, it happened all over the place. It happened over a period of about 20 years and it, it was really messy. Um, but this court case, Worcester v. Georgia, that came out of all of this, it was in 1832. Um, a gentleman named Samuel Worcester, he was a missionary to the Cherokee and he was an ardent defender of Cherokee sovereignty. With the encroachment of white Americans into native lands, Worcester and his sponsoring Christian missionary organization, the American Board, took their case to the Supreme Court in order to gain some clarity on exactly what the relationship between the state governments, the federal government, and Native American sovereignty were. Because, like I mentioned before, George Washington and Andrew Jackson were handling these things very differently, and they needed some clarity. Now, in previous cases, the Supreme Court had determined that the Cherokee Nation was a, quote, domestic dependent nation with no rights binding on a state, which would make them seem like their own, you know, foreign foreign entity. An 1830 law was passed in Georgia stating that no white Americans could live it on Cherokee land without a state license. And since Worcester was white, remember, he's a Christian missionary. He was actually born in Vermont. Um, he took umbrage with this law. So what Worcester argued was that this law uh, took away the Cherokee sovereignty, right, the, their own power to determine who can live on their land and who can't. Like how is it uh, – if they have this sovereignty, this tribal sovereignty, then how can the state of Georgia pass a law saying that no one can live on their land unless they have a license? Well, that should be – Worcester argued that it's up to the Cherokee to determine that, not the state of Georgia. So he protested the law and made this claim. He refused to leave the land and or get a license, and he and 11 others were arrested. Um, I'm sorry, he and 10 others were arrested, 11 of them total. Nine accepted pardons, but Worcester and one other didn't, being sentenced to four years of labor at penitentiary for being on Cherokee land. Keep in mind, the Cherokee were welcoming him there. Um, Worcester accepted his punishment, so the Cherokee would then be able to take their case to the Supreme Court, which they did. And they won their case in the Supreme Court. John Marshall, in a groundbreaking decision, said, quote, The Cherokee Nation, then, is a distinct community occupying its own territory in which the laws of Georgia can have no force. The whole intercourse between the United States and this nation is, by our Constitution and laws, vested in the government of the United States. So, broken down, this ruling stated that, number one, the relationship between the U.S. and Indian nations is that of nations, just like George Washington viewed it. 
he reasoned that the U.S. inherited their rights in dealing with the natives from their former mother country, Great Britain. Great Britain held the rights of exclusively dealing with the natives as a foreign power. And they, you know, made it very clear that no other European country was allowed to do so in North America. So that's the power the U.S. had. Now, Marshall recognized that treaties and conquering Native Americans through warfare could lead to specific results also, but that was through the federal government. Marshall made it clear that states had no authority over Indian affairs. Therefore, Georgia's 1830 law requiring Worcester to have a license was invalid. Now, you may be thinking, well, the Trail of Tears still happened. And states still force knaves to do a bunch of stuff, so why are we talking about this court case? And one of the reasons we're talking about this court case is because this is a really an inflection point on the Federalist ideal during Jackson's presidency. Because what's interesting is that even though the court made this decision, they didn't send any federal marshals to enforce it. They left it in the hands of Andrew Jackson, and he didn't lift a finger. It's commonly believed that Jackson said, and this is like a famous quote of his, even though it can't 100% be attributed to him, quote, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it. It's it's probably an apocryphal quote. (laughs) Yeah, for sure, for sure. But I I think the point is, and and he likely didn't say it, but the reason it's become such a common and, and famous quote of Andrew Jackson, so to speak, is because that's likely how he felt. And so it, it, it in a very concise way, sums up his feelings um, about this decision. Jackson was likely afraid that if he tried to enforce this decision, it would lead to armed conflict between federal troops and the Georgia state militia, which, of course, he did not want. Worcester was eventually freed, moving to Indian Territory in present-day Oklahoma, and while the decision was ignored at the time, Jackson moved, and because Jackson moved forward with Indian removal, this case has been used as a precedent to further support Native American sovereignty ever since. And so Worcester v. Georgia is a groundbreaking U.S. Supreme Court case that, strangely enough, did not have much of an impact in the time in which it was actually passed. Also, it, it does bring into uh, – there will be a couple of points in U.S. history where laws will be uh, conveniently not enforced or interpreted in a way where the plain meaning of the law or the amendment is not actually being applied. And this is one of these cases. So um, to put this into a modern example, not to deviate too much, uh, basically marijuana is illegal on federal law. Yet in a lot Mm -hmm. of states, it's legal. And it basically seems that, uh, slightly editorializing here, but it basically seems that nobody wants to take the political football on the federal level to reconcile this, either one way or the other, of like, hey, guys, this is illegal. We got to enforce this. Or, well, this is kind of weird. All these states have legalized it, but it's illegal at the federal level, so we're going to come in and legalize it. Nobody seems to Mm want to do that. Uh, but that's an, it, you know not to make the violation of native sovereignty equivalent to you know, no this, no but. of course not no no but I, I do think that that is an example people can relate to and it it helps further it helps people further understand what we're dealing with here a, a federal law can be a federal law but if the federal government doesn't enforce it then then it doesn't matter right if there's no enforcement of it 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 doesn't matter. Um, and a Supreme Court decision can be a Supreme Court decision, and the constitutionality of a law, a state law, could be null and void. But if the state doesn't care and the federal government isn't willing to step up to reinforce the Supreme Court decision, then the decision has no teeth, at least in that moment. Another example of this is the Fugitive Slave Act, which is passed in the mm-hmm. 1850s, and northern states yep. basically stopped enforcing it and it's actually one of the complaints of the southern states in the secession is that the northerners have violated the constitution and are passing their own laws and are actually usurping the uh the application of federal law and the recovery of slaves of enslaved people yep yep absolutely not 1850 and that was that was a very big deal a very big deal But this Native American removal, the Indian Removal Act, didn't just impact the Cherokee because this 
There, what types of Zach? What types of broader impacts did this have on Native Americans all over the country? So, uh, you, you basically, you talked about how there were a variety of Native peoples moved, and they were moved over different periods of time. So, in the South, it's the Choctaw, the Cherokee, Seminole. Uh, these nations are moved into the Oklahoma area. Uh, from the Midwest, it's the Sauk, Osage, uh, Wyandotte, Kickapoo, uh, Powhatan. I'm saying that wrong. I apologize. But these peoples are okay. also moved to the- our, our listeners know, but by this point, they recognize that you're not very good at pronouncing native native tribes. I'm, I'm pretty decent. Pretty decent. <laughs> um, uh, but they are all being moved uh, west of the Mississippi. There are other native peoples who are already there, Uh, for instance, in the Kansas region um, and uh, basically in this southwestern portion of the United States or middle portion of the United States, there's the great Comancheria. So the Comanches have their plains empire there that has been uh, basically pushed the Apache into the southwest of the United States. Uh, They've been raiding uh, and collecting tribute from the Spanish and then Mexican uh, people. And actually, this is partially why Texas is such a depopulated area and the Mexican government will invite Anglo settlers as a part to create a barrier against Comanche raids. Uh, So as these newcomers are arriving, there's conflict. So it's not just that they're being basically packed up and, you know, asked to move west of the Mississippi. They're arriving and then there's other native peoples there with guns and horses who are like, who are you? Why are you here? Why are you on my land? You owe me stuff now. So um, this is a trend that also happens in native history. So the uh, while the Comanche are the Great Plains Indians of the southwest, the in the north, it is the Sioux, the Lakota. And the Lakota are actually originally from the Minnesota area and were pushed out due to firearms and by na- natives with firearms competing for uh, access to the fur trade. And they were pushed out of Minnesota into the plains. And their founding myth is when they're pushed out in the plains, they find a, a horse. And horses are not na- – were reintroduced by the Spanish in the 1600s. So uh, – you know, we tend to, as Americans, tend to have this view that the Plains Indians are this ancient culture that went back from time and memoriam. When in reality, uh, it was the Comanche and the Sioux were early adopters of a technology that had just arrived in horse in horse husbandry and exploited it way better than their rivals, and that's why they became dominant players on the plains. So, uh, great book, Comanche Empire, and. Um, It is basically all about uh, reconceiving of the Comanche's presence on the plains and drawing an equivalent to them to other Great Plains nations, particularly in the steppes and the Mongols and whatnot, and basically how they dominated that region and uh, have often been written out of American history. And it's important to remember that they were there and had a big impact on the uh, southern plains of the United States. So I, I, I think you did a really good job summing up like just the, the, the different impacts that they've had on Native Americans all over. I know earlier in this episode, Zach, you mentioned the Black Hawk War, and I think yes. now may be a good time to get into that. And I know that the Black Hawk War wasn't sparked prime, you know, directly out of the Indian removal, but I do – know yeah. that it played a role so, in the conflict. So what was the Black Hawk War? So it, what happened? It's named after a chieftain of the Osage, uh, a gentleman by the name of Black Hawk, uh, who the Osage were originally from the St. Lawrence region of uh, mm-hmm. at River Valley and had been basically gradually pushed further and further uh, west. And um, essentially in 18... 18- because of you know 1830 this time period with this act they're told to go west of the Mississippi and Black Hawk basically forms a resistance and has several followers and basically uh, they fight a war with the United States ultimately are defeated and the United States uses a pretty simple strategy which is uh, kind of equivalent to um, controlling what we would think of as kind of like controlling the population. So uh, attacking villages, seizing people, putting them into uh, forts, um, what the British in the Boer War would later call concentration camps, which then became something totally different in the 
40s, but uh, and is ultimately defeated and or forced to go west of the Mississippi. And that was in 1832. Uh, incidentally, that is why the Chicago Blackhawks exist. Is this that is where the Usage had settled and. Um, the Chicago hockey that's team. That's an ice hockey team. Yeah, by the, the Chicago, way. Uh, the city of Chicago took uh, the name Blackhawk for their hockey team. So, that's interesting. So, uh, but that's it's it's definitely worth remembering how many actual words are native words in our lexicon. So Pontiac talked about Pontiac's rebellion, um, mm-hmm. and an Ottawa chieftain who had led resistance against Western encroachment. Talked about Blackhawk uh, as well. No, that's interesting. I, I, obviously, I knew that. Obviously, I knew the Chicago Blackhawks were named after Blackhawk, but for whatever reason, I just never really put two and two together. Maybe that's because I don't watch ice hockey. <laughs> well, um, well, one of the things is it makes me feel really insecure when I watch ice hockey because I, I like came and ice skate, <laughs> so I'm like, I can't. These guys make me feel bad. I can't watch it. <laughs> well, the. Uh, uh, one of the things that you could take from the Black Hawk War is basically the United States really starts to land on a very clear tactical approach, or pardon me, I should say, a strategic approach with dealing with natives, which is essentially you know seizing the population, moving the population to forts, uh, controlling the population, um, trying to deprive the warriors or followers uh, access for free movement. There is a book called uh, The Gray Fox, which is about a U.S. officer fighting in the southwest of the United States against the Apache and how he, uh, when he would basically defeat groups, he tried to always offer their warriors a a hand up by basically incorporating them into his troops so they can continue their warrior traditions. Um, So there there are some unique things, Mm. a little much better than, you know, Custer and Sheridan's approach, which was basically... You know, genocidal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the easiest way to put it. Yeah, for sure. But so what? So so you 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 have the Black Hawk War in Northwest Territory. You're in Texas now. What was what was the impact? Oh yeah. So basically, all these newcomers show up, and uh, it it rocks the Comancheria. So um, in te- and what is the Comancheria? The Comancheria is uh, basically what is a is a area in the middle of the United States. Think. Northern Texas, Kansas, Nebraska, uh, parts of Oklahoma, uh, going all the way to Santa Fe, New Mexico, Arizona. Um, And uh, basically the Western, or pardon me, yeah, the Eastern uh, Comanches had typically been a little bit more warlike than the Western ones. They would uh, raid the uh, Texas, Northern Mexico area, trade it with the uh, Western Comanches who would then go to Santa Fe and trade it with uh, the New Mexican authorities there. Um, Basically, all these newcomers showing up causes a lot of problems and a lot of frictions and creates more raids, more violence, and that violence uh, bleeds into Texas as well. So there is a famous Texas flag of a star and a cannon that says, come and take it. Uh, that cannon is in reference to uh, literally a cannon that was given by the Mexican authorities to the Tejanos to fight off Comanche raids. And when we get to Texas independence, uh, the Alamo is a Spanish mission, but it was fortified for Comanche raids. And it was fortified mostly to actually keep cattle and horses in it. So um, when we actually get to the Alamo, it's a it's a horrible place to defend because it's not really actually meant for defending against the siege. It's really more about defending, mm-hmm. make sure your livestock doesn't get taken. Uh, so it does basically unleash uh, a series of tick for tack raids and violence in the Comancheria. Now, part of it is also a variety of native peoples get introduced into Comanche Nation. Um, in First Nation cultures, there was a lot of... Uh, uh, hostage taking and these hostages would often be incorporated into tribes and would create uh, familial bonds across tribal groups which would be very key for settling disputes uh, so that kicks off that as well um, but uh, you know I, I, so it, I mean just a huge domino effect well yeah with, it, it, it with, puts with it basically all, all, throughout, all throughout the nation yeah it puts pressure on uh, uh the Comanches. However, I, I really just want to stress the fact that, you know, these people, uh, 
who were being removed from the southeastern of the United States or par- parts of the Midwest of the United States to the west of the Mississippi, there were people there. <laughs> and the people there were not happy that new people were showing up. Um, and it's important to remember that, you know, as a white American, oftentimes we think of Indians as a uh, homogeneous group of people, when in reality, they were a variety of nations who had their own interests, uh, their own competing goals, their own self identities and cultures. And, um, and that's part of why when at the beginning of the episode, we talked about how there's always these brief periods where native peoples kind of form alliances across nation groups, but there's always competing uh, nation groups and tribal groups within native cultures at this time, in part because they can't quite conceive of uh, being completely forced out. And uh, mm-hmm. essentially, when these refugees are arriving to what becomes Indian territory in Oklahoma, um, you kind of wonder if, you know, what, what could have been different had somebody talked to, uh, I'm sure something like this happened at some point. But anyways, when we get to Texas and Texas independence, we can talk about the Comanche Wars. Cool. Okay. So- sounds good. And I'll definitely tab you to come on to talk about them. Oh, it's just as depressing. Um, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> it's actually, as an aside, the little teaser stuff like that, uh, Sam Houston, uh, the namesake for the city that I live in, actually not that bad of a guy. <laughs> no. Hey, I'm... I'm a fan of Sam Houston. So, all right, yeah, no, I, I like him. I like. We should him. probably you know, do an extra was, uh, credit about him. He, do, well, well, real quick, you know, and I mean, we're we're clearly wrapping this up now because we're rambling about random things. But uh, I I love having you on, Zach. You give such a unique perspective, and it, it you approach things so much differently than I do. I think it's really valuable. Um, but you know, Sam Houston was boys with um, Andrew Jackson. Yes, they were. And 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 Andrew Jackson expected. Sam Houston to be like there were people within Jackson's inner circle that thought Sam Houston would become the governor of Tennessee and then Sam Houston would be the one to run for president after Jackson and then Sam Houston went off and moved to Texas there is a uh, <laughs> they were like what if anybody is interested there's a writer named like they were shocked by that people yeah. people were shocked there, he just like threw away his entire political yeah career. there's an eastern Tennessee man who is a former army ranger named Andrew Exum he's an excellent writer I would encourage everyone to follow him uh, on Twitter uh, and he likes the joke that uh, Texas wouldn't be Texas without Tennessee Tennesseans <laughs> And there's yeah, some truth to yeah, that. That's probably true. There's yeah, definitely truth sure. to that. That's part of why sure. it's called the Tennessee Volunteers, right? Tennessee folks would yep. volunteer to go filibuster. Well, Zach, thanks so much. Uh, like I said just a moment ago, thanks for coming on. It's been too long. Hopefully we can have you on again soon. Um, I love these more informal discussions about about topics, and uh, yeah. I always learn something. Hopefully, every time. hopefully we are depressing people. Um yeah. Uh, well, well, you ha- you have a tendency to sometimes get get a little depressed when you think about hey man, things like this. Like so, COVID's out. I've been I've been smiling. I've been smiling through the mic the whole time, yeah. baby. I'm positive. Well, um, I did mention uh, a book. I couldn't uh, think of its name. Um, this is about the uh, uh, Indians in Oklahoma who basically there was oil on their property and white people married into the yep, family and mm-hmm. murdered them. Yeah. Called Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, gotcha. It's actually by. Uh, an author named David Grin, who also wrote a very excellent book called The Lost City of Z, which I would recommend reading and was recently made into a movie. Great. Well, we just dropped about six different book recommendations throughout <laughs> this episode. So I hope people were writing them down and you can check them out. Um, I'll make sure I throw them up on the website. So next week, I am bringing on my other uh, podcast co-host or contributor, whatever you would like to call them, uh, Bill Gorman. And Bill is going to be talking to me about federalism and federalism in the first uh, presidential term of Andrew Jackson and how Andrew Jackson as a president really worked to redefine what being the United States president really meant. As you have probably picked up on, he's a bit different than the ones that came before him. So thanks for listening. And hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed.